So um, I'm going to talk about um, four more uh, soldiers who fought in the American Army during World War I. And this actually started out as a dissertation topic. And then afterwards, I spent uh, a lot more time researching, got a lot more information, and I turned it into my first book. So I actually studied at Temple University, and then I was lucky to study with Russ Widely, who <coughs> was the leading military historian in the United States. He has since passed away. And I also studied a social history and focusing on interracial studies with Dr. Ken Kuzmer, who's still alive and kicking in, <laughs> and he's still at Temple. And what I thought about my dissertation topic, I knew that this mass immigration took place right before World War I, and I thought, hmm, what happened to all these immigrants? Did they get drafted? Did they not? You know, if they didn't get drafted, you know, how did the native-born take it, etc. So I went to see Dr. Wiley about a possible dissertation topic, and he said, I've never seen any primary sources on this, uh, but it'd be great if you could find something. He called a number of military historians that he knew and he got the same answers. Would be great if you could find things, but never seen it. And he said, you know, this would be the mother letter if you could do it. So down I went to the National Archives to talk to the World War I expert down there. And he said the same thing to me. He never saw anything, but it would be great if you could find something. I don't know what to send you. So defeated, you know, I'm walking across the threshold thinking, well, I'm going to start over. And as I'm about to leave, he says, wait. Um, why don't you go look at the military intelligence division records? People are finding really strange things in there. And this was when they had the genealogists and historians together, and there wasn't enough like the film readers, so you had to kind of, it was like combat down there. Because <laughs> you know, were not enough machines, and you, you went to the bathroom, you came back, and someone took your reel off, and <laughs> so it was really hard. And I spent three days battling my way against geologists <laughs> for machines. And after three days, so it's correspondence, so it starts with A, and then it has all their, you know, who they correspond with, and then B, and then C, and then, you know, onward. So um, there it was, it actually was, um, it was a B that I, that I got to after three days. Broke, D, Chauncey, broke. And underneath it said, Foreign board, aliens. Oh, wow. So I took all the numbers down, I pulled those files, went through them, got other names, went back to MID files, pulled their correspondence, got more names, more names, more names. In the end, after years of research, I had, and my husband can attest to this because he kept saying, Can we throw these out? Oh, no, 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 my babies. Ten totes, like, you know, totes. Full of material. I actually found this postcard also, and that told me that I want something because you see the postcard, it has different ethnic names under on Lady Liberty, it says Americans All. And so I sent that postcard to Dr. Wiley, and um, on it I said, So this is the this is how I found it. It said Deep Chauncey Brewer up top, but that's the numbers you would pull. Uh, to find the boxes, and this just, you know, would say foreign war and speaking, you see it here's, uh, this is Bosch, a box that speaks German, Slovak, and I sent this postcard to my friend and to Kuzmer. I found the mother look, the game is afoot. <laughs> so I was very excited, um, and started, started my, you know, thousands of documents that I found, and eventually so, almost all the interests that I looked at, or I found in this, these thousands of papers, were from Eastern and Southern New York, which is mostly immigrants that came in the late 19th and early 20th century, were from Eastern and Southern New York. Um, and most of them are Catholic and Jewish. And from 1880 to 1924, 26 million immigrants came into the United States, obviously interrupted by the war. 
from 1882, 1917, 23, well, 1914, more sorry, 1914 for them, 23 million immigrants came into the United States, mostly from Eastern Europe and Southern. So there's a lot of people coming that I you know, wanted to know what went on. So, um, and I also began to see these um, cartoons, and here obviously is Lady Liberty and Uncle Sam, and he's forcing a German American to buy Liberty bonds. So I said, well, did the army like force the immigrants to perform? Um, they had a captured audience, and what did they do? You always get history going in questions. And there were posters, are you 100% American? Prove it. Buy Liberty Bonds, etc. And then remember your first rule of American Liberty: buy you know, Liberty Bonds. So my question was, you know, how did the military, how did the War Department do it with this captive audience, if indeed there was a captive audience? So I'm going to look at chapters that I wrote. The first one's about the ethnic community. I'm not going to spend a lot of time there um, because I really want to look at the draft and the camp training, etc. <clears throat> and then this is the uh, enemy alien, which would be anyone born in the Austro Hungarian Empire or anyone born in Germany. So I'm going to explain all this to you. So the complexity of ethnic patriotism is the first chapter on the ethnic communities during the war. I'll just tell you a little bit about that. Then we'll look at drafting. Then we'll look at organizing and training the foreign-born troops. We'll look at socializing native-born and foreign-born troops, which will be a very interesting uh, why. And then we're going to see that the War Department actually <coughs> respected the cultural traditions and religion of the foreign-born troops, and you'll find out why. And then I'll draw some conclusions. So that's where we're heading. So first, drafting for more no-boys in the American army. So the, after much debate in Congress, the, the War Department um, decided that they would break down the drafting. Um, well, I'm sorry, let me tell you a little bit more about the, the community first. So in the community, So, immigrants who came here would stay in ethnic communities because they didn't speak, they didn't speak, most of them didn't speak English, they could read their newspapers, they could form uh, fraternal organizations, they could establish their own banks, etc. I mean, like if you couldn't find a job and you had to go to China and you don't speak Chinese, you would move into an American little neighborhood. Right? I mean, that's just natural. And you would live there, and then you would slowly assimilate into the Chinese culture. And that's what happens all over America, and I'm sure you know this, because there's Little Italy, and Chinatown, and, and Philadelphia, and Kensington was the Irish community, etc., etc. So, um, these different um, communities in these different ethnic groups um, divided up that way. And um, the Irish communities, they wanted to stay neutral. They did not want to go to fight this war before we entered the war. And the reason why is because, and I'm not going to go into great de detail about this, but we were declared ourselves neutral, but we were really helping the British way more, giving them major loans, giving them major equipment, etc. And to stay neutral, we were, had to do the same thing the Germans, but we weren't giving that much money and that much equipment. So it was very clear that if we ended the war, we were going to enter on the Allies, on the British. The Irish hate the British, right? And they knew, they were like, we don't want to fight with the British, so let's just stay neutral. So they really pushed the various organizations to push the federal government and Wilson. They would send different tracts and resolutions, stay neutral, stay neutral. The German Americans, which is the second highest 
ethnic group in the United States, wanted to stay neutral because they would rather not fight their brothers, and sometimes literally their brothers, if they didn't have to. So they both are pushing to maintain neutrality. Eventually, America does end the war, um, and when it does so, the United States, um, like other countries, develops a propaganda machine. And they really had to do this because uh, the United States, as far as 1916, when Wilson won, it ran for office in November 1916. His slogan was, I kept you out of war. And now, a couple months later, he wants to declare war, and he gives this big war message, and Congress declares war. It has to do a lot with indiscriminate submarine warfare and killing civilians in war, etc. But we went to war. So this is not a popular war. So the propaganda machine is trying to convince people, yes, this is a good war. We're going to educate you why we're fighting this war. We're saving the war for democracy, etc., etc. So they create the Committee on Public Information, and they, they uh, um, and it's a high-pitched, emotionally charged campaign, and they let they give a lot of power to local elites to run this campaign on a local level. And a, lo a lot of these local elites are natives; they're anti-immigrant. So what you see in the local areas is a lot of harsh Americanization, right? In Philadelphia, for instance, if you look at the Philadelphia Bulletin, there was a thing that said, clip, clip, um, all the Germany, Germany must go. And they gave scissors to all the kids in school, and they said, go through your textbook, and we're going to cut out all reference to Germany in your textbook. Which is OK, but what are you cutting out on the other side of the page? It could be like the Star of Michael Banner. Yeah. So, and he, I'm sure you've heard this, but like they forbid like German bar to be displayed in a lot of museums, and the orchestras wouldn't play German music, and silly stuff like German measles was renamed Liberty Measles, Sour Crab, <laughs> you know, Liberty, you know, Measles, and you know, on and on and on. It got really, really silly, but it also got, oh, there's a dark side. There was violence and even death of, of um, a lot of violence and one death of a German American. So not a good thing in society. And you know there was, um, you know, much 100% effort at conforming. Give up your way of life. Give up your language. Give up your culture. Prove that you're an American. And this was part of this. Um, you know, campaign or you know, for the war, but so you know you're not you're supposed to always answer questions and ask questions, not come up with conclusions. But uh, the only people that even looked into this because they didn't know where the records were, I found them by fluke, assumed that the army harshly Americanized because the public elites harshly Americanized, right? And so oh, they must have done the same. And in fact, they had not. So the other ethnic groups, not besides the Irish and the Germans, they actually were a lot of them were from the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and they hated the Austro-Hungarian Empire because the Austro-Hungarian Empire was gobbling up all these little countries, and they didn't want to be part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. They considered themselves from the oppressed races. Races was used. In a word we used to call ethnicity now, they would call back then they would say you're from the Italian race, you're from the Czech race, that okay. And they said, We are from the oppressed races of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. We hate them. We would like to fight, you know, in the American army to destroy the Austro-Hungarian Empire. But the problem is that if you are from the Austro-Hungarian Empire or from Germany, you are considered an enemy alien and you have to go register in the post office. And as you're going to see, you technically can't be drafted. And that was very disturbing for people in the Austro-Hungarian Empire who hate the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Yeah, they were born in that empire. But these, you'll see in these communities, the ethnic communities, they'll have parades 
and they'll be in their ethnic dress with the American flags, and they're we support America, we love America. So there's pride in you know in being American, but there's also pride in being from their homeland, which they would love to free from the evil Australian. They have fundraisers to have relief efforts from their homeland. They send in resolutions to the government pledging their loyalty to America, etc., etc. And I'll tell you about the draft in a minute. But those who were not eligible for the American draft, they got permission for three allegiances. One was the Polish Army that recruited out of Pittsburgh, and so if you weren't Polish and you weren't eligible for the American draft, you could join the Polish army and fight overseas with either England or France. Then there was the Czech Oslovak, this is before Czechoslovakia was put together, that's in the after the war. Uh, this was called Czechoslovak Legion, and they fought in France. And then there was the Jewish Legion, and they actually fought in Palestine, right? And they were promised the world and then didn't deliver, um, you know, promise to, to, this is part of the Zionist movement, and they were supposed to get Israel to homeland after World War I, but that didn't happen. All right, so now we're going to draft. There's a lot more that I can tell you about. I don't want to get into the neighborhood stuff because that's a whole different story. So let's talk about draft. So there's a, the, the uh, Congress is debating, debating, and debating. Finally, come up with these characteristics. One, if you're a diplomat, you can't be drafted. Because they don't want an American diplomat in some other country to be drafted into foreign armies. So, if you're a declared immigrant, you come to the United States, you declare your intention of becoming a citizen, you fill out your papers, then you have to wait five years, right, before you can take the next step. If you filled out those first papers and you've declared your intention of becoming a citizen, you are eligible for the draft. Okay? You're a declared immigrant. If you never filled out those papers, you never gave your, you never declared your intention of becoming a citizen, you are not eligible for the draft. But how do you prove that you never signed papers? Like, it's kind of impossible. Oh, no, I didn't sign those. Give me proof you never saw those. <laughs> and again, if you're from Germany or the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you're considered an alien enemy. And most of those who are alien enemies didn't want to be considered alien enemies. And, and many of them already had military experience. And they're like, you want to fight? You want to fight? So that was a problem. And we'll talk about naturalization as one solution to these problems. So what happens? <laughs> All right, June 1917, first draft. All right, almost immediately, problems of the 123,277 immigrants who were drafted in June 77. 9,000 of them were enemy aliens from the Austro-Hungarian Empire area. They, all, most of them, almost to a man, asked that they could stay in the army. They didn't want to be sent home. So after much discussion, they decided that it would be up to the commanding officer to determine whether the enemy aliens, quote unquote, I call them technical enemy aliens, were loyal. And if the commanding officer saw they were loyal, they could stay in the army. And again, they didn't have military experience, etc. There were German immigrants who were drafted accidentally. Same deal. If the commanding officer felt they were loyal, they could stay. There were 1,000 foreign-born Germans that you know, yeah, who, were, who were accidentally drafted. There were also German immigrants in the army that were there before the draft, before this 1897 restriction of immigrants. So, it's, if you go all the way back and you follow immigrants, there's been immigrants that fought in every single war we've ever fought in. But then when we cut back the army afterwards, we always go, oh, no, we don't, we don't want immigrants in here. Because <laughs> we cut back and we then just have the, well, you know, the white 
thing before Protestants. And then when we go to war, we need more manpower. Then we go, okay, immigrants, we need you. <laughs> and then the war's over, okay, goodbye, immigrants. So these German immigrants were in the war before they put up the restrictions again. And the same thing, you want to stay, you can stay. And again, they were already in there and they stayed. Um, and uh, okay, and then uh, that was the first draft. There were the first draft, ready for this? 76,545 non declarants, right? Because, well, like I said, how do you prove that you didn't possibly you sign your papers? Most of those requested to stay, and they were allowed as long as their commanding officer uh, said yes. Second draft, 191,419 non declarants waived their rights to be honorably discharged immediately, and they stayed in the Army. So there's a lot of immigrants who are being drafted by accident because of confusion, and most of them overwhelmingly asked to stay, and as long as the commander said they were loyal, they could stay. And I have page after page after page of commanders saying yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. Now, one way to solve this is if they're naturalized. So the War Department sends out memos to all these camps and says, look, you can't coerce them into being naturalized, but you can suggest you know, that would be a good thing and we'll make it really easy. They don't have to wait five years. We won't charge them any court costs. They just need to have an officer um, swear that they're loyal, and we'll bring the judge to the camp so they don't have to go to the judge. So they made naturalization much easier, no waiting period, fees waived, the judge comes to the camp, and an officer just says, yeah, you're a loyal, you're a loyal um, immigrant, you're loyal to America, and you've become naturalized. And I have list after list after, after list of thousands of immigrants who became naturalized in the army camps. And I, I'll show you some of that. Yeah, but, yeah, here's one of them right here. So this is, you can see the different ethnic groups all the way down here. And then you'll see the numbers in June and July, September, 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 the total. And I can't tell if that's a five or a three, but you know, even if it's a three, it's 3,160. Those days. So when I period, when I, you know, that's a short amount of time. It's pretty good. And then I blew it up so you could see the ethnic groups. A lot of different ethnic groups. Russian, 200, so 244. And then 382. Because there's a lot of Russians escaping the SARS, organized programs, and, yeah, and a lot of them were Jewish, and they're escaping. So it's going on there. So it's not surprising that you see a lot of Russians. Okay. And then in the infantry journal, there were different um, quotes that I found um, about immigrants. And this one says From out of the melting pot of America is a mixture of races, again, they would say ethnicities, is being born a new American, a soldier. Man who wearing khaki and covered with dust of the parade ground is stepping forth into the ranks. File upon files of him to make the world safe for democracy. He is the non English speaking soldier who, along with his American born brothers, has been selected through the draft to drive the overseas barbarians back into their lair. So, uh, okay. So that's the draft. Now they're in the camp. Now what? Okay. So what happens is the War Department gets all these memos from different camp commanders going, what do I do? There's all these immigrants and they don't speak English, or they don't speak English well enough to be effective soldiers. Help. And so they, the War Department actually develops a foreign-speaking soldier subsection, which is under the Military Intelligence Division, 
So the military intelligence division, military morale section then becomes a division, the military morale division, foreign speaking soldier subsection. Now it's important about that morale. This is the first time that the war department, or, or you know, the first time the military is looking at morale in a very serious way. This is like this is when psychiatry, psychology is new. Social welfare is new. There's a lot of the sociologies that are coming out right around now, and uh, morale is a big issue. So the War Department is very concerned about making sure the soldier understands why he's fighting, feels good about why he's fighting, you know, you know, it's, it's, what, what, I don't want to say being a happy soldier, but you certainly want him to have this spirit um, about him, and you know, you want to meet his needs. You want to find out what the soldiers lacking and meet that their needs. They actually have morale officers in every camp to find out what the soldiers are, are needing or why they're distressed or whatever. So they now have all these foreign board soldiers. And they you know, need to also do that, make sure that their morale is also up and find out what they need, etc. So the foreign speaking soldier subsection was run, run by two officers. They hired or brought in from the ranks Lieutenant Stan Stanislav Gudowski. He was a naturalized American citizen born in Russian Poland. He was from a prominent family. He was fluent in Polish, Russian, and Bohemian. He uh, knew personally all the Polish leaders in America. He was very close to the Polish press bureau, etc. So he and a small team that he assembled that knew many different languages from the upper class of the ethnic communities went through all these memos, made phone calls, trying to figure out what the problems were in the camps. And they found out that some of the camps had 20% of the soldiers were foreign-born. Most were unable to effectively speak, read, or write the English language. One source said that over 100,000 soldiers were from 46 different nations. Um, and others, um, the communication and morale problem is exasperated because they put them all together. So there's all different, you know, languages being spoken, and they can't communicate. Plus, they gave them kitchen duty, peeling potatoes, washing pans, and a lot of these men had military experience. So they're totally insulted that they're peeling potatoes when they, they, they stayed in the army, even though they might have been enemy aliens or non-clearance, because they wanted to fight, and here they are peeling the tanks, right? So there's a real problem. So Gadesky assembles a team of well-educated, many of them with university degrees, the leaders in the ethnic community. So they're doctors, they're lawyers, they're businessmen, they're ethnic. Um, newspaper editors, etc. This is the cream of the crop of the ethnic communities. Remember, everyone lives in the ethnic enclave, so he's getting the, the, you know, the upper class of the ethnic enclaves. They speak together Russian, Polish, Lithuanian, Italian, Spanish, French, Magyard, um, uh, uh, Serbo Croatian, Yiddish, Hebrew, etc., etc., etc. And they start at Camp 40 because it has the highest number of immigrants. It's a replacement in Georgia. So he, he asked his team to go down there and they start interviewing the soldiers to find out their problems. And they decide that what they're going to do is they put them all in a development battalion and then to interview them. And then they separated them out into ethnic specific companies. So you had an Italian company, you had a you know, Jewish company, you had a Czech and Slovak company, company, you had a, you know, whatever company. Different ethnic groups had their own company, right? And at first, then they had a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant officer who had a bilingual 
Trans. Well, that's totally nuts, especially if you're in battle. Can you imagine that? You know, you're not a translator. Why does the translator get shot? <laughs> like, it's just a stupid idea. So then he's, they're like, okay, that's not good. What we have to do, and this is amazing, we are going to promote bilingual officers, right? And they say and the best thing to do is actually not second generation, but the first generation, the immigrants themselves, because they understand, you know, they understand what it's like to be an immigrant. And we're going to send them to officers candidate school. And they actually send memos to the officers candidate schools, a number of them, warning the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants that you better treat these men with respect. Because a lot of them know a lot more than you do about fighting. And a lot of them have a lot more experience than you do. So you better treat these men with respect. So this is really interesting. So now you actually have immigrants as officers who will be leading these ethnic specific companies. Now, and then they, you know, they're going to be trained in English, etc. But what's interesting is the plan is, once they go into the AEF, the companies will be knocked down to platoons. And this is what they equated it with. They said the platoons will be like little ethnic colonies in a larger American community. So they can still talk their language like Italian, but they're forced to keep up with their English and assimilate. That's kind of brilliant. And, right, so they, that's how they equated it. Now I want to go off topic for a minute because I met a, a, a gentleman called me a couple years ago, and uh, he's an English professor, and he was, was really excited when he found me, and he was like talking all the time. Oh, you put him on? And he was he wrote a book called The Bullet and the Pen, and he's in the process of writing it. And he wanted to challenge uh, Faulkner, um, Fitzgerald, and who's the third guy? Faulkner, Fitzgerald, and anyway. First of all, I didn't know this, but only one of them served. <laughs> and that was in the overseas, and that was in the ambulance board. They, and they all lied. One of them faked a limp, <laughs> you know, like uniforms made, etc. And you know, English professors are always saying that they were writing about their horrific experience. Well, two of them were in the United States and never even left. So he is arguing, by using my book, that they were upset about the advancement of immigrants, and particularly immigrants in the office and that, that I haven't read these three works in a long time, but there, in every book he says there's immigrants that get the girls and their officers. I don't know, I'd have to reread it. But his book, he published a book and it got great success. And so I thought that was kind of neat <laughs> that he, uh, he looked me up and was asking all these questions. So, anyway. so now we're good friends. We actually uh, visit each other, etc. So it's called the Bullet Pack if you're interested. English and the fixture, etc. So now besides, all right, so this is the bulletin. So once the, they knew Camp Gordon plan was success, they said, okay, then we want to do this all to all the camps. So they hide, they put together more ethnic group leaders and they span out to all the different camps. And this is, you know, saying here's the Camp Gordon plan. And here from the Infantry Journal again, not more than one hundred four more knew the English language well enough to understand instructions necessary to maintain a first class fundamental. So that's, and then this is the National Geographic magazine. And this is Italian officers who are bilingual, they're immigrants, they're teaching Italian soldiers how to speak English by using the National Geographic magazine. I found this at a barn in Westchester. It was very cool. <laughs> Wait, oh my God, how do I find this? You don't know, haste that. So after a class of foreign language soldiers um, has before become thoroughly familiar with the charge made from the pictures of the National Geographic, it is ready to try the magazine itself. So this is an Italian uh, officer training Italian men. 
again using the geographic National Geographic. Far more soldiers using National Geographic as tech. Okay, so and then there was, you know, others came to help. The Assistant Secretary of War organized professors who, you know, spoke different languages and they came in to teach English. Um, the YMCA of the Jewish Welfare Board got volunteers. The National Education Organizations sent people. And the bilingual immigrants, uh, um, you know, who were soldiers, uh, also were asked to help. And a report that I got from this, and I mean, this is after learning, I mean, believe me, uh, this is after learning how to dig a trench and, you know, the gas mask and fire machine gun, all this. Then they spent three hours a day learning how to speak English. And it was all based on like military thing, language because they weren't just <laughs> place to see English. Was, like, you know, Holt, who goes there? You know, machine gun, you know, all kinds of things they're going to need when they go overseas. So, the a report, the War Department says, confusion and mis- uh, report, the War Department attempted to avoid confusion and misunderstanding by grouping, handling, and controlling the immigrant soldiers without the waste of time and foreign human material. The Chief of Staff and Director of MID, Military Intelligence, Estimated that the government was financially better one million dollars for each one thousand men so saved by the new Camp Gordon reorganization. And so again, yeah, it went all through the camp, all the camps, and did this. Right, the next chapter is kind of I'm not going to spend a lot of time in this chapter, but it's interesting. Now Newton Baker was the Secretary of State. Secretary of War, sorry, Secretary of War. He was a progressive reformer in Cleveland when he was mayor. And he found out that it's much better if you give people that are getting arrested for vice and crime, uh, if, you, if you have alternative things to do instead of vice and crime. So he started having the city build playgrounds and baseball fields and football fields and the whole idea was let's you know clean up the environment and therefore people won't turn to gambling or robbery or drugs or prostitution because they'll have all this other stuff to do. And so he brought that idea in with him and, and he picked Fawcett, Brandon Fawcett, to head up the commission of training activities because Fawcett was also a, um, a, a progressive reformer who believed the same thing. So Fawcett says we were charged with responsibility of cultivating and conserving the manhood and manpower of fighting forces by providing a clean and wholesome environment. Now here's what they're really worried about, the narrow disease. There's no cure. Right? And there are, uh, there are serious problems in the British Army. We have, you know, crippled divisions. Um, once you have BD, that's it. I mean, you're just waiting, you know, to go to the next stage. You can't fight. And so then they decided they would bring in progressive reformers and ethnic group leaders to help them, the soldiers, to say, hey, why don't you go to a hostess hut where you'll find a woman that looks like your mama, because they hire like you know, out high mama, mama types. And it'll be music, and you can play radio, uh, a photograph, and you can write letters home, or you can go play baseball, or you can play football, or you can play, you can act out in the theater, or I mean, there's just tons and tons and tons of things to do. And so Fawcett says the commission's aim to surround the men in service with an environment that is not only clean and wholesome but positively inspiring. The kind of environment which a democracy owes to those who fight on its behalf. So, you know, instead of, you know, having a night with a prostitute, go play baseball. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, plus they wanted to lay the foundations of Americanization. That was another part of this. And that actually comes from more of a Jane Addams uh, social welfare. 
Jane Addams was brought the settlement house movement to America, and they, she lived in the ghettos with the immigrants, and she would um, invite, like, say, all the Italians over one night, and they would have spaghetti dinner, and she would show them slides of the best Italian painters, and she would applaud them, like, oh, you know, the, you know, you should be proud of your culture, you should be proud of your traditions. And then another night she'd have them there and they would have, you know, one Anglo Saxon Protestant food, and she would teach them English and she would teach them history and civics. So she like gradually Americanized them, but she still respected their culture. That's what the you're gonna see the army was doing. Exactly that. So English language classes, they also had civics classes and citizenship classes. There was the Order of Liberty Alliance, which the soldiers could join, the immigrant soldiers, that would say that they are you know, loyal to America, they love America. And the American Library Association provided books of US government history, but they also brought in foreign language newspapers and books in foreign languages. So that the soldiers could go, the immigrant soldiers could go to their houses, huts, the Jewish welfare board and the Knights of Columbus, that was for Catholics, the other one was for Jews, obviously, and read in different foreign languages. The upper class in the communities made sure they were not socialist Bolshevik crap, right? <laughs> so they, they prejudged everything. So here's the YMCA, which opened its stuff. Everyone can join the Y, but uh, and there's football, and there's baseball, and there's an army song club, and there's an army band, and you can do a lot of things. And they have these little fun things, like you can go to pee the 100 yards dash, or you can ride a donkey backwards, or whatever. <laughs> the soldiers, you know, instead of just using the YMCA, which is a Protestant field, you know, why not have your own? So the ethnic group's leaders said, well, why don't we, what can we have our, you know, the soldiers have their own that are Catholic? So the Knights of Columbus came in and built for Catholic mass would be here on Sundays, and they also have their magazines and newspapers and books, and here's the Jewish Welfare Board, they would have their own thing as well. Finally, this is the last chapter, and this is really probably the most important part. Um, and that is um, what they did to respect, the War Department did to respect ethnicity. And it starts out with the Polish soldiers. Polish soldiers are about to go overseas from the ADF, and they want to say their last confessions. Because if they die overseas, they wouldn't make their last confessions. They want priests, but not just priests, Catholic priests. They want Polish Catholic priest, because as you probably know, a Polish Catholic priest is way better than an Irish Catholic priest, right? You, now, I live in Bloomsburg, it's, I used to be from Philly, but I got a job at Bloomsburg University, and we're not in the coal town, but there's coal towns near us, and we've been through them many times, and a lot of the students come through this. You drive down the street in any of these cold towns, and here's what you'll see a Greek Catholic church, an Italian Catholic church, a Polish Catholic church, an Italian Catholic church, because these are the different ethnic groups that were coal miners, and they all have their own Catholic church because their ethnicity and their religion are entwined. They wanted Polish priests. The word of God got the Polish priests to hear their confessions. And then the Greeks wanted. Um, to have off on St. Nicholas, which was their high holy day, and the War Department got them off while they were in the camps. And they said, overseas, we don't know, you know what's going to happen if there's no battle or whatever. Yeah, you can stand out or whatever. But, and then um, the uh, Star of David, um, the, all, all, all men killed overseas and burned overseas had the cross. The Jews said, We'll pay for the Star of David, we'll go over there and we'll put a woman. We just need permission, and the War Department gave them permission so that the Jewish soldiers could have the Star of David on their, on their graves. Lots of bread they asked for on Passover. The War Department said we will give you lots of bread in the camps, we will do our best to serve lots of bread overseas in France. You can imagine. 
if you know anything about the battles going on there and how horrific they were. And there were times when nothing's going on. I mean, it's pretty good that they say we'll do our best to get you lots of bread in the fields of France. Um, the Jewish Welfare Board supplied over 100,000 prayer books and 8,000 Bibles in Yiddish, including 18 religious prayers and three American patriotic songs. And uh, a couple other things. Um, there were officers who were using ethnic slurs, like, you know, blah, you know, whatever. And the War Department put out a general order for say, forbidding people to use derogatory terms as, quote, it's a, a nature likely to affect the morale of immigrant soldiers, and it would, and it said it would reprimand any soldier who used ethnic slurs. The uh, Italian soldiers were upset because the Italian flag was not seen in public as much as the British flag and the American flag, and so the War Department contacted the Chamber of Commerce in the United States and said, Will you please try to get the Italian flag around? And they put them into all their camps. Um, allotment checks. These are allotment checks are the checks that go to your parents or whatever. So a lot of these young kids' parents are overseas. And and they have long names that, you know, the secretaries couldn't really um, I mean, they, you know, people are going to mess up. And so what the War Department did was hire immigrant secretaries who were used to those names so that they could make sure that the flock checks actually get uh, to their families. Here's one guy said, if I'm killed in battle, will my life insurance policy make it to Germany because that's where my family is? And the answer was, yeah, but it's probably not until the war's over. <laughs> so, um, and then there's some mistakes that were made. Like, they put the Romanians and the Hungarians in the same uh, company, and uh, they, were, they have a history going back to ancient times of, you know, hating and wanting to kill each other. <laughs> so, um, the ethnic leaders quickly contacted the war department and said, get the hat, and they did immediately. Two other quick things. Uh, Italy um, contacted their, their ambassador, contacted the War Department, and said, Here's a list of Italians that are seen as deserters, but they're probably in the ADF. Could you go through and ensure our, because their family is seen in a negative view, their son or sons are seen as deserters. So that was all straightened out. And finally, during demobilization, demobilization was taking a lot of time. Italians said, I didn't see my well, Italian soldiers said, I didn't see my mom and I'm 10 years, 15 years. I want to go to Italy, would that be okay? Here's what the War Department did. They got them a train to take them to Italy, and then they had a train to take them back to regroup them and the rest of their, uh, with their divisions. But they said one thing if you get VD while you're in Italy, you're not allowed back to the <laughs> I guess you can't have too much fun while you're there. <laughs> All right, and then finally, you know, my, my th thesis, and I have just two quotes. My conclusion is traditionally scholars portray the First World War immigrant experience as one of oppression and forced assimilation. Historians emphasize the awfulness of xenophobia and the harsh 100% Americanism. Foreign born civilians became victims of society, caught up in mass hysteria, and then, on, in David Kennedy's words, stamping out all traces of old world identity among the foreign born. Although there is no denying the repressive social atmosphere during the, during the war or the fierce drive for conformity prevalent in the civilian society, the experience of the foreign born soldier in the First World War American Army was actually much more complex. The War Department directed a training program for immigrant soldiers that did not simply force the foreign born to choose between America or their native country. Instead, it represented a complex alliance between military officers, progressive social welfare reformers, and ethnic leaders.
just as Ford and Gordon consciously planned their early environment, so did the United States military consciously plan a training camp in Europe. And then I concluded that immigrant leaders working with the United States military championed ethnic pride and pushed for fair and treatment of Ford and Gordon by simultaneously inspiring American patriotism. The result created an atmosphere that made dual identity and dual pride acceptable, and the native-born soldier's duty personally easier. And then there are two points that I, I love. One is a French who says, you cannot imagine a more extraordinary gathering than this American army. There's a bit of everything, Greek, Italian, Turk, Indian, Spanish, also, a sizable number of Germans. Truthfully, almost half the officers have German origin. This doesn't seem to bother them. Among the Americans, there are sons of immigrant Frenchmen and sons of immigrant Germans. I asked one son of a Frenchman if those Germans were coming willingly to fight their brothers and cousins. He squarely answered me, yes. And the last quote is from a German officer. Only a few of the troops are pure American origin. The majority are Germans, Dutch, and Italian patronage. But these semi-Americans fully feel themselves to be true sons of their adopted country. And I ended my book saying, they are not semi-Americans, they are Americans all. <laughs> Chinese Exclusion Act that says you know, Chinese laborers can't come in, they can't be citizens of the United States. And then there was a Restriction Act that said well, what they would call back then mentally retarded. If you, you know, they just said you cannot, you can't come in. And then, and then if they thought your child was mentally handicapped, you had to go back with the child. You'd never see your husband and kids again, or your husband would go back. And there were law after law you know, restricting, restricting, restricting. So there, this is, their anti-immigrant sentiment was building, building, building. And uh, it's something, you know, like it's just a repeat. It's, unfortunately, we're, we are a country of immigrants. Every one of us are immigrants, including the Native Americans. And it's, we have an attitude, the last one in, shut the door. And there's so much discrimination against the Catholics, so much discrimination against the Jews. And now we're coming to the Muslims. Like, it just drives me crazy. Because when do we learn? Like, when do we stop this? Because, you know what I mean? We just never seem to learn. Were positive efforts all happening before the war? Or would you say the war was really the thing that kind of started? Oh, the war, they were beating the hell out of the immigrants. <laughs> you know, the war was a terrible time for immigrants. It was just terrible for immigrants during the war. In civilian society. That's what shocked me so much, that the war department was so good to I don't think they're humanitarians. I think they needed a fighting for a good, efficient fighting force, and morale was important. And to give them what they wanted was a way. I mean, to respect their cultural traditions was a way to keep their morale up and have an effective fighting force. You had to hear. Yes. Were African Americans included in this war? They were, there were two divisions that fought with the French, but unfortunately early on, 
the set southerners, you know, this is the congressional records, said, um, said, you know, don't warn them because they're afraid of retaliation for what they're doing. In the South, in the South, the, the African Americans have the right to vote in 1870, but they try to vote and shoot them dead. They lynch them by a tree. So the South did not want the African Americans to go have be combat soldiers. Oh, so they were drafted, but they were put in service positions. Right. Except for the 92nd, 93rd, and the French Revolution. French of practice segregation. Yeah, they were segregated World War One and World War Two. And the Native Americans, the Indians that were here, were they allowed to go to World War One? They they, yeah, and they were actually co-talkers. But World War One and World War Two. Yeah, not all of them were co-talkers, but uh, yeah, there's a couple of books written on that. Really interesting books. Um, so William Sadler, yes, went into action when the war was uh, announced. How was that organized? Was that set up? I know by each one but was it set up in the same way that the War Department does it and sets this up? Like an Italian group and it's not the Italians and all that back in now? I don't know. Actually, I don't think the War Department, I think it was all done locally. I don't think the War Department had anything to do with that because I know that locally a lot of people organize those things. I don't know what the FAP is. It would be very interesting. To find out. Oh, <laughs> yes. Were Chinese immigrants drafted? Sorry? Were Chinese immigrants drafted? Um, Chinese immigrants, um, there weren't that many Chinese immigrants at, because of the 1882 uh, Exclusion Act, and most of them were in California. So, yes, they were, but there weren't that many. And they were pretty much older by then because they had come for the gold rush. So, they had come for the gold rush, yeah. So, um, so yes, but there weren't very many that would have been eligible. The merchant class and the upper class Chinese could come after 1882, but not the labor class, which was, you know, why would you come if you were rich? <laughs> yeah. uh, I wanted to add two things. One is that uh, uh, many of the uh, Chinese immigrants actually had, because they were colonial powers, actually had foreign-born aliens in their own army and they were uh, they were kept together and uh, linguistically they did not mix with the others there were vietnamese troops for the french uh, there were 800 in fact there are grave sites in france for 850 chinese ethnic chinese that uh, came over and and were actually sent over uh, for the war effort. Uh, and so that's an aspect we rarely realize. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But because of their colonial affiliations, you have yeah. many of these uh, ethnic groups participating yeah. on the Western Front right. against the Germans. And, and also the war went there, too. Yes, right? yes it was. Because the war was fought. It was in Asia also. Yeah, and in Africa. Yeah, because of course there were German colonies. Right. And, and yeah. That's a part that we rarely hear about. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to add, because we're talking about American uh, immigrants, is I've been studying the aftermath issues, and uh, what we really have as evidence of World War One are the monuments that have been left behind yeah. uh, in New Jersey more than in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, the monuments that were erected uh, were all independently paid for and uh, determined what they might be on a very local municipality level. Uh, here in Pennsylvania, uh, the state legislature did mandate specific monuments for specific groups or uh, specific uh, military units include a marvelous, you were talking about black soldiers, there's a wonderful monument uh, in recent years been moved to uh, Logan Circle uh, for the participation of black troops of Pennsylvania. But in New Jersey, with few exceptions, they were all done 
uh, by individual towns. And the reason I mention that is because many of these individual towns had immigrant communities, and the immigrant communities were big participants in funding these monuments as a means of showing that this too was something that they sacrificed for, and that it was also showing, even if they didn't have troops represented in the list in that monument, that this was their American means of showing Americanization. Yeah. And if, if you know of any monuments to um, the, the commission, the World War I commission in Pennsylvania is trying to uh, collect, to have a complete list of monuments, because some of them we don't even know where they are. And uh, so that's a project that's going on. Just go online to uh, World War I, uh, World War I Pennsylvania Commission. And, and uh, Centennial, the Centennial Commission. And there's a whole thing that, there. That links to the national one. And it links to the national one. But we're trying to find all the monuments in Pennsylvania on World War I. In New Jersey alone, there are over 200. And I'm sure Jersey's probably doing a similar thing, but it's just Pennsylvania. Uh, actually, they're far ahead of, uh, uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, of Pennsylvania as far as I know. Yeah. Yeah. But it were a small state. Yes? yes. Well, when I was a little girl, there was a monument to the World War that was where steps and manufactured hats. I don't know if it's still there. I'm 80 years old, so I mean, I'm going back a lot. But, uh, I was wondering if it was still there and would anybody destroy it because they're redoing it lately. Yeah. yeah, there's um there's one at the university. There's fifteen students, uh, male students and one Red Cross nurse. And it was the centerpiece for the university because it's on a hill. And if you look down we saw these sixteen trees that were planted in the shape of a star, blah blah blah. Well, in the 70s, they stuck a dorm, boom, right there, and separated it from the rest of the campus. And then it lost its meaning, like no one even knew what it was. And then my, one of my research and writing students uncovered it when he was up in the archives, and we restored it and had a big ceremony. But it's like, it's like hidden now. It's cut off from the rest of the campus. It's so sad. It's like, they no one even cares. cares. John Monday had a huge, uh, I don't know, I can't remember if it was World War Was it in a store? Honors soldiers who, who died and uh, who had been pulling these up. Is it the Wanamaker building still there? Well, I don't know if it's still there or whether they uh -huh. moved it. But yeah, it was uh -huh. there. I mean, every neighborhood had its own yeah. monument to the guys. Because we were still back then, still. And that yeah, was the and no awards. There is one of Wanamaker's for their employees. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, really personal self expression. I was going to find really young. How would I research Well, you, here's the deal. Um, Ancestry.com has now a, it has all the, you know, the draft cards. And what I did for the Pennsylvania Art of Water Road, the immigrants in Pennsylvania, so I went to the, all the local historical society records and I picked out names that sounded like ethnic names and then I went into Ancestry.com draft and I put them in with the years and it came up and it says where they're born, what job they had, if they died, you know, if he ran during the war or later if they knew. So you just need to go in and pay for a month at Ancestry.com and use the draft card and then they have another, you know, two, World War One cards. And one was something. so look at both of those, and if you can find this card, you can find some information out. Yeah, I, mean, I know a lot about his company and stories and so forth. You might find his draft card. And um, do you know what was he born in Pennsylvania? Uh, no, he was born in Italy. I know. I'm sorry. Did he serve in a Pennsylvania uh, division? It, it was the 39th. But you know what you should do is when you go into answers.com and you pull that up, it'll tell you where he served. Well, he was definitely the 39th, but 